Hi, this is Thomas and welcome to another episode of iCollect. Now in today's episode, we are featuring an avid and consummate watch collector and he's going to share with us his interesting watch collection. Now I'm especially thrilled to meet another watch collector because I love watches and I do have a small collection of vintage watch. So let's go and find out his collection. Hi, I'm Jonathan and I collect watches. Hi Jonathan. Hi Thomas, good morning. <laughs> First, let me say a big thank you to you oh, yeah. for sharing your very interesting uh, watch collections. My first question to you is, how did you get started collecting watches? Ah, well, it goes all the way back to primary school actually, when I was oh, like, yeah. uh, very young, 10 years old, I remember we came from a poor family. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I still remember at uh, P2, right, that was about 10 years old, um, I didn't have a watch. Mm. So my classmate has this digital watch, you know, last time at $2 each. Mm -hmm. So back then, my mom gave me like 10 cents a day for recess. <laughs> so I got to save up quite a while, a couple of uh, yeah, weeks for that. Correct eventually bought the watch from him. It came without a strap actually. So, but it was fun. That's my starter watch. Uh, those simple digital thing, you mm. know, just sell time and a uh, date and month. That's all. Then came P6. Uh, father uh, bought me a, what do you call it? Seiko, I think. That's mm. how it really became more serious. Then I, I fell in love with uh, analog watches, clocks and mechanical things, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then came uh, 15 years old while I was working as a waiter in a hotel. Mm. So next to that the uh, restaurant, there was this uh, jewellery shop mm. and they had a uh, semi-hunter pocket watch, British made actually. So every time I would, uh, during breaks, I would visit them to just have a look at it. Mm. Very kind, uh, these uh, proprietors actually brought it out and showed it to I still remember the price, $250. That's, that's a lot of uh, money actually. Yeah, back in 1990, for me it was a lot of money because mm. I was only earning like $4 per hour. So, mm. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to purchase the watch. Mm. But I did purchase something similar in uh, Chrome, uh, Russian make actually from a friend uh, that costed me like 150 bucks. But uh, later on then I realized that watch was probably traded around for like $20 in the market because being Russian, back in those days when the Russian empire collapsed, right? So a lot of the Russian sailors bought all these military stars all out from uh, Russia. So we are doing it, sorry to say that. Uh, that's how it really kickstart off the mechanical uh, journey for me. So I, I would uh, string it up and then carry with me and then you'll show it off to my friends all those things but it worked perfectly actually nothing wrong uh, for what it is 150 unfortunately i sold, sold that watch oh, I was about to ask <laughs> yeah exactly have, i know you have it. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I bought a lot more of it after that subsequently yes. what is, and that uh, in a sense uh, actually planted the seed of me being a, a watch collector, collector yeah. you know yeah. uh, to, to search for all these things Share with us the significance of your collection, the various types of uh, watches here. Oh yes, thank you, uh, Thomas. So, so it's a, a little bit of a journey. So over here is uh, my first Rolex. Oh, it's okay. very interesting story from this. Uh, basically, I was only just uh, 16 years old, came back to when I was a waiter. So I did uh, friend was from Malaysia. Mm. So one day he, he related to me that his father used to operate a watch shop mm. in Sarimban, but he has uh, since uh, retired and passed away. So we got this tray, exactly like that, this tray of old broken up watches underneath his mm. bed. So he invited me if uh, one day during leave we could go back together his hometown, visit him. You give me whatever, I can pick it up. So then came this day, of course, I visited him over there. So we pulled out the tray, went through everything, spent a few hours there. There were a lot of junks, everything. But then I pulled out this particular watch. It didn't have a bracelet. And uh, it was missing a crown as well, uh, a simple watch. Uh, and then, um, you know, but I shook it and it worked. So I thought, okay, maybe we get it fixed. So we took a, a bus back then to Kuala Lumpur. We found an uh, old uh, watchmaker in a corner of a coffee shop mm. in Petaling Street. I still remember I passed it to the old man. He could fix it for us. Uh, costed us uh, 50 ringgit or so back then. Uh, <laughs> this is a fantastic looking watch. Yes, and this particular piece is very interesting, you know, in all my years, uh, 30 years, over 30 years of collection, I have never come across a second piece with this dial. Mm. The Roman numerals, two-tone, everything in there. Oh, yes. And the, sto yeah, the story goes on, uh, back then I was still a student, right? Mm. So I went to school, uh, my lecturer saw it, he said, hey, look, uh, Jonathan, uh, I've got a, I can help you to sell. So, all right, then I subsequently came and offered me a thousand dollars for the watch. Mm. He said, oh, wow, not bad. I mean, can help me to pay my, my school fees, everything, yeah? So I approached my friends, hey, how, what do you think? So I said, yeah, you're do whatever you want. I said, okay, no harm. I said, I split the share with you. So after I sold it, I passed it 500 bucks. And I regretted, of course, being uh, the first watch. Right? But no choice because I got bills to pay this mm. and that, you know. Almost 10 years later, actually, mm. I went back to my lecturer. I ate him and pushed him and I bought it back for three times the price <laughs> of what I saw. <laughs> so it's back with me since then. Then I had it serviced myself, so very, everything. Very yeah. meaningful to you. Yeah, it's experience. very meaningful. Yeah, very, very. So I will never sell this of all whatever collection I have in and out. So it's, you know, one of those things out there. 
All right, coming to the second watch is a Aviator's watch oh, okay. uh, by Breitling. So oh, this is Breitling. Okay. Yes, this is one of the earliest model mm. uh, from the nineteen early fifties actually. Oh, the typical black down, very military look. Yes. Yeah. And a quite a large watch for what it is back then because uh, back in the 50s a, a lot, what is 50s? Uh, you know, a lot mm. of men, uh, men were still wearing small watches actually yes, half correct. the size For 50s I think this is a huge, huge large yeah, watch exactly. yes. yeah. So and then uh, okay, then what we have here um, I collect whimsical watches mm. So this is uh, this is not too old, this is from uh, 60s, 70s uh, this cartoon Mickey watches. Mouse. Yeah, Mickey Mouse is yes, uh, original Disney licensed products. And this is a mechanical. Mechanical, watch, yes. Okay. Yeah, back in those days, uh, before the uh, quartz era, mm -hmm. so they were all mechanical watches. Mm -hmm. But they're fun pieces. Uh, there are mm -hmm. actually books on them as well. So there are different cartoon characters to collect from them. And then, uh, of course, uh, coming up to this is a uh, tri compacts. Being a watch guy, we like to collect complications. So uh, this is like full chronograph, full mm. calendar functions with a moon face. So for a manual wind-up watch, uh, it is one of the most complicated watch available back then. Mm. Uh, this is from 70s. Alright, then coming over again, another complication. This is by Jeje Le Coute, uh, wow. a, a so moon it's, face. It's a very, yeah. uh, actually quite a slim small watch, I think yes. for the ladies to wear it, it's uh, really uh, nice. Uh, but uh, yes, but but back then men were really wearing right. small watches like that. Yeah, but they were very beautiful watches. Uh, look at the lugs, the teardrop yes. lugs, everything. The oh, tone. The color of the dark. Yeah, exactly. That's how they produce watches. Uh, late forties. This watch. very what? interesting. Uh, a Japanese uh, World War Two Seiko mm. So it's a, basically a Seiko made for the military. Mm. It comes with a three-piece case and the dial. Very important. The big characters yes. and then the twenty-four hour markings for military use. So this is uh, way back in uh, uh, World War Two period, nineteen forties. Could be late thirties onwards yes. as well. Yeah. I've got a collection of these pieces. They could come in a variety of dolls and so on. Yeah. And I'll show you later the, the, the king of the, the Japanese uh, military watches. Sure, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, then, then there's uh, another one, again a military. Uh, being a, a watch guy, a lot of us like to collect military items mm. uh, because they, they represent the uh, quality and technological advancements and uh, basically just being military and should be stuff. Very hard here. Yeah, exactly, built to yeah. last. So they're always black down, mm. uh, radium, uh, loom, and then of course the uh, King's Arrow there. Mm. That's for the British War Department. So this is just one of the dozen, there's a, a, a nickname for them, a dirty dozen. Okay. 12 pieces look all, all the same, different brands that okay. are supplied to them. And then uh, coming to uh, pocket watches. So so I'm now very much in the pocket watch phase. Uh, I like to buy pieces like this, it's French made. Mm. So, um, Enameling, uh, these are all oh, paintings. Look at that. Is, uh, uh, this is another pocket watch, a uh, mm. Hunter case. Very interesting. Uh, it took me a lot of effort to acquire this in an auction. Uh, basically, uh, the story of this came about is uh, is possibly yeah, mm. related to uh, one of the founder of Harley Davidson, William Davidson. Uh, mm. is the, the brother. Yes. And then the year is correct as well, everything. Uh, so basically, it's a, a pocket watch, a chronograph with a repeater function as well on top of it. Okay, come. Uh, the hunter case, normally we press the button, open up. Okay. Yeah, there are diamond inserts on the hands as well. Oh. Not much of a brand, it's Swiss made. Mm. Yeah. But uh, this comes to the part about provenances, you know. Mm. Uh, when we collect watches, we want to know the history and yes. everything. So things like this uh, have a very interesting history. Is provenance uh, important to you when you come to your own watch collection? Uh, very much actually, mm. uh, because it relates to the history of the watch. Yes. Uh, there are people who don't like engravings, but mm. for me I love them because every watch with uh, the engraving, there's a history to it. There'll be names like, from uh, uh, grandparents to the grandchild. Mm -hmm. Very common are lovers giving to each other gifts, <laughs> yes. yeah, and a lot of times they actually will, ladies will give the, the gifted rather the, the watch to the uh, men actually. Oh, I see because I understand that that's what uh, a lot of uh, collectors are very um, interested in. Mm. You know the, the story behind the watch. Yes, and then, uh, of course there are the military men, uh, aristocrats, uh, royalties, all these. Yes. Of course, statesmen are most sought after. Uh, like uh, famous watches from uh, Kennedy, you know Winston Churchill, mm -hmm. or even artists like Warhol. All like these are Andy very, Warhol, yeah, yes. Andy Warhol, very, very sought after. All these things. Uh, of course, then you got Elton John's, the living celebrities who own okay. certain watches, their names, everything. Of course, the most famous being Paul Newman, the, the most expensive Rolex I ever sold in an auction. Mm. His watch is Paul Newman's Paul Newman. Oh. Because that watch was given to him by his wife. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and it came out in the auction and sold it recent years. Uh. All right. Then coming to this, uh, this is more modern and, and again another pocket watch by okay. Jaro Genta. Uh, his one of trademark. My favorite, uh, watch uh, designer, you know. <laughs> yes. The so the octagon shape is very interesting because for us Asians, uh, feng shui. Mm. Uh, but so being the octagon is very very auspicious and shape. You see, oh, beautiful. And this is skeleton. That's why I, I picked this up. Yeah. This watch again has a little history in there. Uh, mm. Came from a, a, the son of a diplomat. Mm. So his father was uh, from Middle East. Uh, was stationed in London. 
So it was according to him, it was given to him by the, the Queen actually. Wow. Back then, yeah. Okay. These are some of the dive watches that I collect. Mm. Uh, okay, let, let's begin with these. This is an oh, Omega. Is a dive watch. Yes, yeah, an Omega actually. Wow. So it's one of the actually the first uh, true dive watch. Wow, you, you can't really tell this is can't a dive tell. watch. It's such a such an elegant looking watch. Exactly, and it's rectangular. Yes, unusual, okay. you know. Yeah, yeah to, to produce because back then in the thirties, uh, mm. the the reach were all rectangular watches. So at just time, you need to pull this out oh, to set okay. time, and then uh, put put it back in to get the water resistance in that. So it's just basically on seals. Mm. So again, coming back to that, it's all innovation. So yeah. the uh, watch companies were all experimenting. They were I using. No, this is a dive watch. Yeah. Really, is so can't tell. Yeah. So elegant. I look at all the patent numbers in there. Those days, yeah. So so uh, they were experimenting in material like cork, lead, uh, of course rubber as well, and uh, of, uh, in the end. Uh, these rubber seals were the best. Mm. Uh, these were the earlier kind of, a, um, won't, I won't call it dive watches, but water resistant watches. Back then they call it waterproof. So you mm. flip open, you see there's no crown. Yes. You flip open like a pocket watch and then you again here, uh, I think it's quite difficult, but basically you, you flip a, the watch out to adjust the time from there. Yes. It is very unusual because it's in a tonu shape rectangular. Normally mm. they were in a square cushion form. Yes. Yeah. So again, this is like uh, probably 1920s. Mm. Yeah, they were still experimenting. This is becoming very much like a Rolex actually by J W Benson. Mm. Rolex has the same actually. Yes, which is the, like this pillowcase. Ah, okay, the, the pillowcase. Pillow yeah. 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 Look at the the grip bezel has a function to it. This will help us to grip the bezel better, so we can unlock and lock mm. the screw onto it. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, that is, is interesting. Another early water resistant watch. Um, this is interesting because Singapore is in there on oh, the dial. Okay. This is one of the watch that I collect. Uh, okay, it's very small, uh, but it's basically a retailer's name with Singapore and Hong Kong listed in there. So uh, that company was a pharmaceutical company for that. And uh, of course, uh, then coming, of course, the most famous would be under Rolex, the Oyster watches, the uh, the commercially successful mm. waterproof watches back then. So. Uh, the uh, it was a marketing ploy really. This uh, Mercedes uh, Glaze, uh, the British uh, lady, she swam across the Chanel mm. wearing a watch, which she didn't really wear. It was actually uh, hooked onto a necklace. She was wearing it, but she swam across the Chanel uh, with one of these uh, Rolex oyster. Mm. And uh, when after she finished the, the Fiat, right after I think a couple of a day or so swimming in there. Uh, freezing cold water and the watch was still working and then mm. the next day across the world uh, the, the Rolex was featured in all the advertisements and then uh, this will be like the 60s this is uh, named under the color so so again uh, a dive watch from the 60s uh, mm. back then uh, they were by 60s after the war dive watches were very important Rolex led the way and then many other companies uh, uh, so called copied in a sense with right. this so uh, the, the rest very typical again uh, the the, the bezel uh, this yes. is interesting not much of a brand but why i pick it up is because it is rated to 1000 meter oh. which is huge yes indeed in, uh, for those period yes uh, and look at the lens uh, the crystal is so thick as well yes. of course rolex came out with it first uh, but i think rolex didn't even have the 1000 meter back then hmm. uh, it was only 600 meters so this was a thousand meter but look at the, the thickness of the yes. case the girth everything oh yes how sorry it is to be right. rated to that yeah then uh, this is very interesting it's extremely difficult to find i only picked it up last year it took me almost 30 years to find this particular watch oh. it's a, again a rolex it's the first uh, waterproof pocket watch in the world made by rolex the oyster pocket watch for because nobody would uh, actually produce a po uh, pocket watch that's waterproof you see so yes. rolex already uh, invented so-called produced the uh, the watches these watches that were waterproof mm. so they decided to produce a pocket watch attract customers who may want to do sports with their pocket watches for mm. the gentlemen back then <laughs> so this this that, uh, this is the provenance here we have here so it's dated as engraved back there i think 16th of september 1931 so and this design uh, would be actually um, supplied to the uh, Italian Navy mm. where they produce a wristwatch of it and which became the Panerai. So this is a great grandfather of Panerai watches. Oh, okay. This particular watch is very important history. And then of course a typical Rolex Oyster from uh, the bubble bag that will be the, uh, by this uh, 1930s to 50s they look similar to this. Yes. This is in gold. Um, it's again one of the worst first waterproof and uh, dust proof and automatic watches uh, mm -hmm. in the world. I think Rolex invented it in 1931 or 34. Should be 31, yeah. So this was one, the first uh, automatic watch in a waterproof case, the Oyster. Yeah. 
and that's the DNA of all Rolex uh, Oyster from then on until today. Yes. Yeah. Correct. All right. So coming back to the to sum up the collection. Mm. Uh, I have something here which is uh, from 18th century, 1700s, late 1700s. It's a, a pocket watch made for the traveller back in those days. Mm. Yeah, so for the Turkish market, uh, Swiss made, uh, French made actually. So it comes with this uh, leather bound case which holds the pocket watch inside there. So oh. the, the, it's very interesting because uh, there's, uh, there's external case. Sometimes it could be many different uh, natural materials with leather, whatever. Mm. So this, uh, what we have is Dottie shell actually, yes. with silver work, look at that. And the dial, the numbers are actually Turkish Arabic numbers. Mm. And uh, again, multiple cases in those days, you press open, it's oh. Oh, what they have here. Wow. Uh, look at it. Oh, goodness, <laughs> there's too many cases in there. Wow, it's so look interesting. Let's have fun with that. Yeah, this is supposed to be that. So there we are. Okay. Multiple cases to that. That is the real pocket watch you have here. Mm. Very small. And a key wound up as well. Mm. This will be a birch fusée. So uh, there's actually like a miniature bicycle chain in there that works mm. to keep the watch working. Right. This is very old. Look at the, the doom glass yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. So again, this is made of silver. There are, there are better ones than gold. Sometimes there'll be the, we call the watch paper, uh, maker's paper. Or date 1771. 1771. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Handmade totally. These are the things I look for these days. It's tough to, to keep as part of like a museum collection. Okay. So that's the one of the earliest I go mm. for. Uh, mm. Then coming back, of course, uh, we have others that you guys seen earlier. So this is uh, significant for me in a sense. I just acquired this recently. Uh, Rolex Springs in a 1930s. Uh, mm. This is a two-tone case, 18 karat. Uh, you mm. get it. Uh, we call the tiger stripe or zebra crop. Oh yes. All right. So it's fusing two different gold, white and yellow gold together on a single case, which is mm. very difficult to produce. The, mm. the, the bracelet of course is much later, but I just put it up together with, for mm. the coloured look. It's also known as the doctor's watch being a big second hand, mm. separating the dial. Uh, this is interesting, uh, coming back to provenance, there's a very beautiful engraving on, on the back. In memory of Paris, 1937. Ah, okay. Right. So back in 1937, I checked it up, there was a World Expo mm. held in Paris. So could be that this uh, person was there mm -hmm. and purchased this watch in uh, Paris. All right. In that particular year. Then uh, again, another Art Deco style watch, asymmetrical case, we call this. Thick and thin. So sometimes these watches will worn, uh, we call a driver's watch, on the edge of the uh, wrist while I you drive that. in those okay. days. Uh, this is not the best example. I got others with which folding case to 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 read time, but it's interesting. Different yes. case, and you can tell the the step down a bit Egyptian in look mm. as well. Very typical of the era. And then this is a reversal, but uh, not done by JJ Lecoud, but by Hamilton. This uh, JLC actually sent them an, uh, a legal letter to stop them from producing a reversal. Okay. So again, rectangular watches. They produced for a very short period, I think uh, one or two years before they, they have to stop producing them. Okay. Yeah. Very beautiful ladies watch. Yes, this Octagon, mm. pearl, yes. strung up diamonds and platinum. Look at how, how the workmanship well, is. Th th this would be Art Deco. Ah, yeah, very much. Well, maybe 1920s, around that era. Okay, then we come to the 1920s. Uh, this is interesting for us because it's uh, made for and retailed by Robinson and Company. Sign Singapore. Ah, so, so this yeah. is another <laughs> another watch that has got some you know mm -hmm. uh, history with uh, Singapore. Exactly. Yes. yes. So I have to collect this. Uh, and in fact, I went on to collect several watches. Uh, where I see a name Singapore mentioned, it, I will just buy them up. That would be very yeah. rare, right? To exactly. Yeah. Hard to in, find. Uh, most of these were done prior to World War Two. Ah, uh, okay. uh, when uh, the uh, companies like this, Robinson and Company, was obviously was a big uh, emporium mm, retailer yes. back then. They were like the Tiffany and Co of the uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So they will order watches from Switzerland, the factory produced for them and retail mm. under the brand name to sell to the uh, common folks out there. Okay. So it's interesting. Do a quick jump again, uh, another pocket watch I did with 50s Ameto, my Movado, where they're very ah. famous with this. So basically you wind up by pushing in and out mechanically. So very typical for a traveler back in those days. So there are many different variations for okay. women. Uh, there are a gold version, jewel version, up to the eight days. I have many versions from the tiniest to the biggest one, which is so big. Mm. Eight days clock, <laughs> but under the same design. Okay. And then, okay, we'll jump quick to the 60s, 70s. Again, the driver's watch uh, using uh, a mirror inside to reflect. Mm. Today's this design can be found in big brands and sell for a lot of money. So this, uh, what you do is again, you wear on the wrist mm -hmm. like that, and then you read time. Yes. <laughs> Rather than the top. <laughs> there we are. Okay, then uh, uh, they will be from 90s, IWC. Yes, I remember this design, this Porsche, mm. Porsche, for, design. For Porsche design. Uh. It's Porsche design, right? But this is more interesting. Okay, mm. you press the two button there. Which two button? Yes, yes. So yes. Okay. Uh, flips up. 
there's a compass ah, in there. Ah, very useful. Mirror. Yes, uh, very useful for again uh, pilots or for emergency. So you imagine if you are lost out there somewhere out there, the mirror is useful to reflect light to inform I see. your your these uh, search and rescue I missions. I see. Okay, you can see now. Yeah. yeah. Then we come to the hybrid watches. Uh, oh, sorry. Before the hybrid watches, we have the early quartz. Uh, this is very interesting. A Kami. What I like about this is the it's a new old stock condition. Mm. Um, these were the earliest uh, semi-mechanical and quartz era okay. electronic mm -hmm. watches. Uh, so they use battery. They consume the battery very fast, very quick. I see. Matter of uh, weeks or days, you have to replace the battery. So you do collect some quartz watches. Oh yes, I do. Because I, I, I mean, most watch collectors only concentrate on collecting mechanical watches, mm -hmm. but uh, you do have some. Oh quartz. yes, uh, the, this will be the earliest uh, quartz mm. uh, era. Uh, to me, they are very important mm. in the history of uh, watch making. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they they came up as early as the uh, late fifties. Mm. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, American, Swiss, they were experimenting until I think uh, sixty nine or something. Whereby because of the Japanese uh, uh, competition, they, yes. the Swiss con 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 got together and they developed the Beta Twenty One. This is the Rolex Beta Twenty One, one of the first Swiss made. Uh, and back this is a movement. this is a quartz. Ah uh, yes, the quartz. So this particular movement, uh, the Beta 21, is supplied to a few companies that the uh, TRJ, Patek Philippe, uh, even IWC, Omega, and uh, this is a Rolex version of it. Uh, this is the only limited edition watch by Rolex in history. Only 1,000 pieces made. Uh, they are all serial numbered on the side. Wow. Uh, big block of gold. Yes, because I can feel the weight. Yeah, the rarer one. The weight in gold. <laughs> <laughs> the rarer is actually white gold. Okay. Uh, and then we have the okay the, the of course the Accutron by uh, Bulova. Mm. Again, these are uh, called the astronauts. They were given to the uh, astronauts in those days. This will be late 60s to 70s era. Mm. Uh, very accurate. The Accutron is uh, basically tuning fork. Uh, uh, what do you call technology in there? Mm. Again, you, if you put to your ear, you can hear the, the humming sound. Yes. Can you see that? Yeah. Yes. You're very accurate back in those days. Uh, so accurate that NASA actually used them. Supply them with the clocks, everything using the uh, tuning fork technology. Hmm. So then coming back uh, a quick roll to uh, this will be uh, I think two, 2000 era, late 90s, a hybrid watch whereby you have a LCD screen digital and it pull up. This is a 69 limited edition. Uh. When they press back, it's a mechanical wound up on this side actually. Okay. Make by tech for you. And then coming of course to the Japanese, uh, the king of the uh, quartz, uh, they perfected them. Mm. This will be the uh, spring drive by uh, one of the, this uh, proto, uh, not the proto, but the first production run by Seiko before even the Grand wow. Seiko uh, and even the Credor. So this particular manufacturer is a limited edition, I think uh, 20 pieces in white gold. Wow, and yeah, it's beautiful. The workmanship is mm. yeah, yes. beautiful. The quality of the movement. Immaculate. Mm. So there's a microchip in there that, that controls the speed all this and mm. yet it's a mechanical wound up with the power reserve indicator in there. So more or less sums up my collection, although mm. these are not all. Uh, I collect um, from pocket watches, very a few hundred years old down to uh, the early wrist watches, uh, rectangular, different v versions of it, uh, um, yes. early quartz innovations. Very varied, yes. yeah. So thank you Jonathan, thanks for sharing with us your, your, most welcome. your really really interesting uh, collection of your of watches. We've come to the end of today's episode. We hope you enjoy watching it. If you like today's episode, give us a like, share the video and subscribe to iCollect. If you are a collector yourself and you would like us to feature your collection on our channel, please get in touch with us via this email address. Till the next episode, this is Thomas saying bye-bye for now.